In this review, we will explore the extent ionic compounds will dissolve in water by examining solubility products and solubilities of ions, as well as calculate effects common ions will have on these solubilities. In addition, we will examine the reaction quotient, Q, and compare it to a given solubility product, KSP, to predict if a precipitation will form given concentration of ions, and then calculate equilibrium concentrations of ions after a precipitate has formed. Finally, we will examine selective precipitation and qualitative analysis. So let's begin by reviewing some basic concepts regarding aqueous solutions. So why do certain compounds dissolve in water? Well, one may state like dissolves like, or a polar solvent, such as water, dissolves polar solutes, such as ionic compounds, which are said to be hydrophilic. To better our understanding of water, let's fold the 2D Lewis diagram into 3D by deducing that the central oxygen atom is sp3 hybridized. Once the 3D diagram is completed, we can place the individual dipoles that arise due to the differences of electronegativity values and then add them to afford the net dipole as shown. Thus, it may be simpler to think of water as a bunch of polar mini-magnets, and when water dissolves ionic compounds, it may help to remember how the water molecules are oriented around the ions and that this is a very dynamic system. In other words, water molecules are in constant motion. In the past, you may have learned that all ionic compounds are soluble in water, or maybe when studying precipitation rules, you were taught some products of double displacement reactions were slightly or moderately soluble. Well, chemists don't use adjectives. We use numbers to describe the extent to which something happens. And when expressing solubilities, we will use molarity, which is moles per liter. You may have assumed complete dissociation with ionic compounds. However, some products may collide and reform reactants to establish an equilibrium. Recall, equilibriums will employ the law of mass action, or commonly called the law of equilibrium, which is shown here. When a dynamic equilibrium is reached for calcium fluoride, we can apply the law of mass action, but solids and pure liquids are omitted from equilibrium expressions. Thus, we call this the solubility product constant, or simply KSP when we omit the solid reactant denominator. It is worth mentioning that units are not included with K or KSP values. Thus, at this point, we should define the solubility product constant and solubility for a particular ionic compound in pure water, which are usually recorded at 25 degrees Celsius. The solubility product is an equilibrium constant derived from the solubilities which are amounts of solid dissolved in water and are given in moles per liter. It is important to know how to go back and forth between solubility product and solubility values. For example, if the solubility of calcium fluoride is 2.2 times 10 to the minus 4, what is the KSP of calcium fluoride? From the stoichiometry of the balanced equation, for every one mole of calcium fluoride dissolved, one mole of calcium and two moles of fluoride will be dissolved. Thus, applying the given solubility of calcium fluoride at equilibrium, we will have the following concentrations of products. Placing those solubilities into the solubility product expression yields the KSP for calcium fluoride. Conversely, what if we were given the KSP for calcium fluoride and asked for the solubility of calcium fluoride? Or maybe we were asked to calculate the concentrations of calcium and fluoride at equilibrium. Well, first we would write our change, place those values into the solubility expression, and solve for x. Here, x equals the solubility of calcium fluoride, as well as the final equilibrium concentration of calcium ion, and twice this value is the equilibrium concentration of the fluoride ion. It is worth our efforts to do one more example that is a little more challenging. Given the solubility of bismuth sulfide, 1 times 10 to the minus 15, what is the KSP of bismuth sulfide? From the stoichiometry of the balanced equation, for every 1 mole of bismuth sulfide dissolved, 2 moles of bismuth and 3 moles of sulfide will be dissolved. Thus, applying the given solubility of bismuth sulfide at equilibrium, we will have the following concentrations of products. Placing those solubilities into the solubility product expression 
yields the Ksp for bismuth sulfide. Conversely, what if we were given the Ksp for bismuth sulfide and asked for the solubility of bismuth sulfide? Or maybe we were asked to calculate the concentrations of bismuth and sulfide at equilibrium. Well, first we would write our change, place those values into the solubility expression, and solve for x. Here, x equals the solubility of bismuth sulfide. If we multiply this value by 2, the final equilibrium concentration of the bismuth ion is obtained. And 3 times this value is the equilibrium concentration of the sulfide ion. Now let's examine how a common ion will affect solubilities. In the previously solved calcium fluoride example, we calculated solubilities in pure water given the Ksp. Well, let's compare that solubility to a solution that has 0.025 molar fluoride present. In pure water, we would write our change, place those values into the solubility expression, and solve for x. Here, x equals the solubility of calcium fluoride, as well as the final concentration of calcium ion, and twice this value is the equilibrium concentration of the fluoride ion. Now let's add our change within the common ion calculation and place those values into the solubility expression. Here x is expected to be so small that it will be negligible when compared to the 0.025 molar initial concentration of fluoride, which allows for simplification of the math. Solving for x gives the solubility of calcium fluoride, as well as the final equilibrium concentration of the calcium ion. The final concentration of fluoride is 2x plus 0.025 molar. However, as mentioned previously, 2 times the change is negligible when compared to the large initial concentration of fluoride. Thus, the final concentration of the fluoride ion will equal 0.025 molar. Comparing the solubilities of calcium fluoride, we see that the solubility of calcium fluoride is four orders of magnitude less and the solubility of the calcium ion is also significantly less. Clearly, the solubilities have decreased in the presence of a common ion. Or we could say the presence of a common ion impedes the solvolysis of calcium fluoride. Next, we should examine precipitation, which is the reverse of solvolysis. To predict if a precipitate will form, we will calculate a reaction quotient, Q, and compare it to the known Ksp. If Q is greater than Ksp, then a precipitate will form, which will be important with future problem-solving strategies. This comparison will only indicate if a precipitate will form. Later, we will demonstrate how to calculate the concentrations of ions in the resulting solution after a precipitate has formed. So let's do an example calculation of a Q value. In this double displacement reaction, we see that we are given the Ksp value for the solid that may form, cerium-3 iodate. Recall, a double displacement is when the cation of the first ionic compound gets together with the anion of the second ionic compound, and the cation of the second ionic compound gets together with the anion of the first ionic compound, as shown. So let's write down the quantities given within the example problem and convert these quantities to moles. For every one mole of cerium-3 nitrate given, it will yield one mole of cerium-3. Similarly, for every one mole of potassium iodate given, one mole of iodate is present. Dividing by the new total volume, which is a thousand mils or one liter, gives the new molarities for each ion. It may help at this point to rewrite this equilibrium as shown before doing a Q calculation. The Q value is obtained by substituting the given initial concentrations of the ions that will be responsible for the formation of the precipitate into the solubility product expression. Once the Q value is, is obtained, it is then compared to the known Ksp, which is presumably given within the problem. In this case, the Q is greater than the Ksp, thus a precipitate will form. But what if we were asked to calculate the equilibrium concentrations of ions left in solution? 
In the next example problem, we will learn strategies to solve this challenging type of problem. So let's keep the concentrations and quantities the same, and let's calculate the concentrations of the spectator ions first, the potassium and the nitrate ions. After calculating moles for each reactant, we realize that for every one mole of cerium-3 nitrate, three moles of nitrate are formed. Thus, dividing the moles of nitrate by our new volume total gives us the molarity of the nitrate ion. For every one mole of potassium iodate given, one mole of potassium will be formed. Thus, dividing by volume total affords the molarity for both spectator ions. With concentrations of cerium-3 and iodate calculated, we will again show the Q calculation to see if a precipitate of cerium-3 iodate will occur by comparing the Q and the known KSP for cerium-3 iodate. Here the concentrations of cerium-3 and iodate are high enough to afford a precipitate. To determine the concentrations of cerium-3 and iodate ions in equilibrium with solid cerium-3 iodate, we will first assume the reaction goes to completion, which will require a stoichiometric calculation where one reactant will be the limiting reactant and one reactant will be in excess. Here the cerium-3 is in excess. After calculating the molarity of the remaining cerium-3 ion, we simply redissolve the cerium-3 iodate in the presence of the ion in excess, which is the same as a common ion problem. Now let's add our change within the common ion calculation and place those values into the solubility expression. Here X is expected to be so small that it will be negligible when compared to the 0.0276 molar initial concentration of cerium-3, which allows for simplification of the math. After solving for X, we see that the final equilibrium concentration of iodate is three times this value and that is negligible when compared to the initial concentration of cerium-3. We have now calculated the final concentrations of all species in solution. So let's review our problem-solving strategy. First we calculate Q and compare to the given KSP. In most cases Q will be larger than KSP or the problem is essentially done which is not too interesting. Also, remember to use the new volume total when calculating the molarities of ions within your Q calculation. Second, assume the reaction goes to completion, which is the same as a limiting reaction problem where one reactant will be consumed and one reactant will be in excess. Remember, when moles or millimoles of the reactant in excess is calculated to divide it by the volume total to afford the molarity of reactant in excess. Last, have the solid redissolve in the presence of the ion in excess, which is now similar to a simple common ion problem. So let's use this strategy again within another problem. In this example, we have volumes and molarities given for two solutions that will undergo a double displacement reaction where lead to iodide will form with the given KSP value. We need to first calculate the new molarity of ions present that will be used in the Q calculation, the lead to and iodide ions. Don't forget to divide by volume total when calculating the new molarities. Now we can calculate our Q value by substituting the new molarities into the Q expression. Again, more often than not, Q will be greater than KSP or the problem is not that interesting. Here, again, we see that Q is greater than KSP. Now we can complete our stoichiometric calculation that assumes the reaction goes to completion. And we see that 8.7 millimoles of iodide remain per the new volume of 319 milliliters, which gives the molarity for the ion in excess. Now have the solid redissolve in the presence of the ion in excess, which is similar to a simple common ion problem. Now let's add our change within the common ion calculation 
and place those values into the solubility expression. Here x is expected to be so small that it will be negligible when compared to the 0 0.027 molar initial concentration of iodide, which allows for simplification of the math. The final equilibrium concentration of lead 2 is equal to x, and 2x is so small compared to the 0 0.027 molar initial concentration of iodide that it is negligible. We can further leverage our knowledge of KSP values via selective precipitation. For example, if a mixture of metal ions were present in solution, we could exploit our knowledge of KSP values to selectively precipitate out one of these metal cations by adding an anion that precipitates only one of the cations while leaving the others in solution. Here we have left behind cation A and cation B while cation C has combined to form a precipitate. Conversely, if a mixture of anions were present, then we could add a cation that could selectively precipitate out the desired anion. For example, anion B. The key here is to exploit the different KSP values. So let's execute a specific example of selective precipitation. Here we have a 0 0.0150 molar solution of both metal cations barium 2 plus and strontium 2 plus. If we add a sodium sulfate solution very slowly, let's say dropwise, which cation will selectively precipitate out first? Let's first set up the equilibria and write the given KSP values over the equilibrium arrows. Now let's add the concentrations, include the expected change to reach equilibrium, write out the KSP expression for each, substitute predicted equilibrium values into the KSP expressions, and finally solve both for the concentration of sulfate required to begin the precipitation. When the sulfate concentration reaches 7.3 times 10 to the minus 9 molar, the barium sulfate will begin to precipitate while the other metal cation, strontium, stays in solution, which demonstrates the property of selective precipitation. In addition, when the sulfate concentration gets as high as 2.1 times 10 to the minus 5 molar, the strontium sulfate will begin to precipitate out of the solution. The concepts covered within selective precipitation are further demonstrated within this classic qualitative analysis diagram, which begins with over 20 metal ions that can be selectively precipitated with various reagents separating these metals into five major groups. Qualitative analysis demonstrates if a metal cation is in solution, but says nothing about the quantity. Once a precipitate is formed within a group, then various techniques can be employed to differentiate which precipitate is present and will not be discussed here.